BirdTopic is an awesome Python library for analyzing large groups or collections of text, a language processing task called topic modeling. In the first episode of Talking Language AI, the creator of BirdTopic, Martin Chotendorst, will be giving an overview about BirdTopic and tips for new users and advanced users alike. Talking Language AI is a series featuring talks and conversations about NLP topics, tools, and people. If you have any questions or comments, please visit the Discord link down in the description. Let's now hand it to Martin, psychologist, data scientist, and creator of open source packages like BirdTopic, Polyfuzz, and Keybert. Um, so Jay already did some introduction. Um, let me reintroduce myself. I'm Maarten Grotendorst. Um, for those who don't know me, like Jay mentioned, I used to be a psychologist. Um, I've did that. I've done that for a few years. And over the last few years, I've transitioned into data science. And as, as part of that transition, uh, I thought it would be interesting to explore natural language processing a little bit further. And, and during that process, I felt compelled to challenge myself and create some packages to see if I could, you know, truly, truly create something interesting. And I hope I have done that. I hope that's still the case after you have seen this. And if you don't feel that's the way, uh, that's also fine. Please let me know. Any and all feedback is highly appreciated. Um, so the topic of, of this specific talk is about bird topic. And as the name implies, it's a topic modeling approach uh, that aims to be highly flexible and customizable. Uh, now that will be true to some extent and to some extent that might not be the case. And we'll go through where that's possible and where it isn't. Uh, now, before we go into the code and the examples, uh, there's some documentation, of course, that you can look for yourself if things are unclear. Uh, you can, of course, always post any issues, any discussions on the repo, and I'll do my best to answer them as soon as possible. So it's a Python package, uh, it's hosted on PyPy. So it's, it's essentially a pip install per topic and, and that should be it. Uh, there are some other language backends that you can use. Uh, many of those that you saw in the poll that uh, Jay posted just now, like Spacey and Flare and Jensen and these kinds of things. And what they actually do, I will go into that a little bit later. For now, three lines of code. That was the very first API decision of per topic. When you do topic modeling, we want it to be as simple as possible. So you import your package, you instantiate it with the default settings. And then we do a thread transform like scikit-learn uh, with a list of documents. And that throws out a bunch of topics. Now, before going into how per topic actually specifically approaches this topic modeling task, let's go into what topic modeling you know, what it generally is considered as. So what we often have is we have a bunch of documents, whether that's tweets or articles, um, tickets for your software with a lot of issues. You have a lot of code out there, a lot of documents, and you want to make sense of those documents. And you can't really read through 100,000 of those things. So you kind of need to resort to some, you know, AI, for example. And in this case, topic modeling. And what is essentially is doing is extracting topics from those documents. And instead of saying, okay, here's a topic about space travel, it gives you back a number of words like space, launch, orbit, lunar, so that you, the user, can decide, oh, this is about space travel. Because if I were to give you the topic cars, for example, then I'm still not clear what that exactly is about. Is that about older cars, newer cars? Tesla specifically, or is it even about the movie Cars from Disney, right? It can be something entirely different. So we still need some contextual information. And topic models are, are quite old, actually. Uh, they stem from the, 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 you know, quote unquote, basic bag of words type of approaches. But even then, there was still the context to be considered in, in language. Um, and that's essentially what topic modeling is doing. It, it needs a topic description so that you understand what the topic truly is about. Now, the way your topics 
approaching that topic modeling task is by reducing it to a clustering task. And I've chosen a clustering task because it's mainly because it's intuitive and it allows for some flexibility with respect to the models that you're using. You know, you can essentially say, okay, I'm clustering all of these documents to create semantically simpler, similar documents and hence topics. That, that's essentially the entire description that you need to give. Now, the way your topic does it as a default is as follows. So we use sentence transformers to do the embedding extractions and sentence transformers works fast out of the box and creates very nice representations of the documents, often optimized also for clustering tasks. So out of the box, it works well. We reduce the dimensionality of these embeddings. They're typically hundreds of dimensional space uh, where those embeddings reside in. And you know, with the curse of dimensionality and, and many Euclidean based clustering algorithms, uh, let's first reduce the dimensionality. Now, after that, we do the clustering. And for that, we're using HDBScan because it provides some outliers. We can say to some of the documents, you know, I, I don't think there's any topic in there or any interesting topic. Uh, let's skip that one. And what we've done thus far is we've done basic clustering. And next, from those clusters, we're going to do the topic extraction. And there are a lot of ways we can approach that. But there's something done here specifically, and it might seem simple using something like bag of words, but what it essentially is doing is it's not making any assumption on what the clusters look like. So with HDBScan, we have a density-based clustering algorithm, and as such, it, it, it not necessarily assumes, but it, it may expect that some clusters in shape look entirely different from another. And as such, uh, you need a topic extraction approach that may or may not account for that. But what happens if you switch out HDBScan with k-means, for example? Your clusters will look entirely different. They may be more or less accurate depending on your use case, but the structure of them is different. We then can suddenly consider centroid-based methods. And if we then swap it out with agglomerative clustering or Burge or whatever you can imagine, that impacts the way we do the topic representation. So what we want is a topic representation that doesn't make any assumptions on the clustering approach. So we resort actually to a very basic, but exceedingly working well approach, and that's a bag of words. But you know, we're not so much interested on a bag of words on a document level. We want that on a cluster level. So we consider the, in, the collection of documents in a cluster. And that's, that's somewhat different from considering them as a document because we're doing it one level higher, right? We're considering clusters, not documents. Now, on top of that, you can do TF-IDF and it works well, but it also considers generally documents and not so much clusters. So we need to adjust a little bit so it takes into account that what comes in is not a document, but a cluster. So we change the formula a little bit. Now we have this pipeline. Basic enough, right? And there's one small twist that makes it a little bit more modular. And that's a fact, um, it's a linear process, right? The embedding extraction approach has, does not have such an effect on the back of words approach. So whether you use sentence transformers or spacey or gensim or whatever, the back of words approach doesn't really care. It just wants some clusters and from that extracts the topic representations. And as a result, we can be exceedingly flexible with this entire pipeline. So what we have is modularity, first pillar of per topic. We can say, okay, I don't want to use sentence transformers because I fine-tuned a spacey model or my own transformer model. So I'm going to be using that UMAP. For me, that's that's a difficult model. I, I'm not, I don't have an intuitive grasp on that model, and I know PCA rather well, so I'm going to be using that. And I know how many topics there are in my documents, so I'm using k-means, so I can specify those. And I know there are no outliers in there, so HDB scan doesn't really fit. Now there might be some non-Western languages that don't tokenize on spaces, but on different things. So you can use different tokenizers instead. You can even say, okay, let's throw in some part of speech 
into the tokenizer to only extract nouns, for example. And by giving you that flexibility, I'm basically saying, okay, here's a, a default model of sentence transformers you map HDB scan, but you're free to build your own topic model. Here are the Lego bricks. You know your use case. You know what is necessary to do your, your analysis, your research, whatever it is you want. And you can, you can build it in the way that works for your use case. And this works because we are trying to minimize the assumptions that we have with respect to the dependencies of one algorithm or another. We can make a highly optimized model with, with the perfect you know, uh, steps one after another. But if your use case differs, then suddenly the entire model doesn't work anymore. So by giving you some modularity, uh, it allows you to pick and choose what works for you best. Now I've shown you a lot of pictures and I've said a lot of things and <laughs> that's all nice and interesting, uh, but let's take a look at a little bit of code to see how the output actually, you know, what it looks like. Um, so I'm gonna skip over this one. Um, Archive articles. Now we have all read the articles here. Uh, Archive is, is a really nice database with, uh, Mark, yeah. Before you go into it, uh, since you're showing code, can you maybe zoom in a little bit uh, just so the code is more? Uh, it's, it's not that clear, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is much better, thank you. Perfect. Um, you know, we want some data and uh, what's nicer data than a lot of abstracts from mostly computer vision and some machine learning uh, articles. And I randomly sampled 10,000 of them just, just to make it a little bit easier for myself. And that's what we're gonna do the topic modeling on. This abstract, for example, is about reinforcement learning. And so we have a lot of more of those abstracts that we want to see, okay, which articles or which topics become you know, popular, uh, which topics can we find? Can we find some relationships between some of those topics? Can we do some fine tuning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can train our model. We can do the exact same thing as we did before. We import our package, we instantiate it and do a fit transform on our abstracts. Now I can do that, but I'm, I'm kind of lazy and we have limited time. So I'm gonna load in the model instead I've done this saved the model and, and now I'm essentially gonna load it in, which I've done before. So after this training procedure, and this training procedure is of course, sentence transformers, uh, UMAP, HDB can scan CTF, IDF, we can view the topics that we have created. So what we do is we have our topic model, we do get topic info, and what we get is a data frame that has several columns. We have the column topic, that shows you the topic ID. It goes from minus one to 147. So we see two things happening here. There are a lot of topics that were found as a default, but there's also that minus one. And that minus one, those are outliers. I'm still showing the outliers because otherwise you feel, feel like you're missing documents, but those are all the documents that couldn't be clustered. And we can fine tune it so that it becomes larger or smaller, but that depends on HDB scan. We have the count of the number of documents in a topic. But most interestingly, we have the topic representation. We have the topic ID and then words that are you know, best representative of that cluster of the topic. And if you pick this one, that's reinforcement learning, right? And we have some object detection and we have some adversarial attacks and we can go through all of these topics and see what exactly is happening here. We can also say, okay, we're gonna pick the top 10, 10 most frequent ones and I read through them, we see uh, segmentation, some molecular topics. We can dive into those to see what exactly is being talked about. Something uh, about transformer models, self-attention, vision. It's interesting to see that also being there. Um, we can go through all of these topics and, and, and read them. But we can also say, okay, I don't like this representation. I don't like the four here. I don't like those underscores. I think there are way too many words here. So let's customize our topic labels. Now, we can generate topic labels automatically based on the words that we have here. But instead, let's say we have three. We remove that topic prefix because it's ugly or it's annoying or you know whatever the reason might be. 
And we change the separator because that underscore might make it more difficult to read. And one thing that we add on top of that, let's define our own topics because I, I think I know that this is about transformer-based models. And I know that this one is about reinforcement learning. So we can also do some topic labeling here. Now we run this and we get exactly what we've done before, right? What we wanted to be doing, we want to have this representation a little bit nicer than this one. And we might be doing this because we want to visualize certain topics and you know we have some topics that are more interesting than others. So we label them. But you know, you can also say I want 10 words or 20 words. So it gives you a little bit more understanding of what is happening here. And there are a bunch of more things that we can do with the topic model. We can update the topics to you know change the n-gram range because I want words concatenated in a way. I want to merge certain topics because I think they are very similar to one another and I don't want to consider them separately. I might want to reduce the topics to 100 or 50 or 10. I might want to find certain topics that I couldn't find before or because I don't want to go through 150 topics to see if my topic of interest is in there. And there are many things that we can do with, with something like this um, that gives us a little bit more control over how our topic model looks like. But after doing all of this, we still want a little bit more knowledge about which topics are in there, but also the relationship between topics or the relationship between documents and topics or the relationship between words within the topics, et cetera, et cetera. And for that, we come to the second pillar and that's the, the visualizations that are possible with, within per topic. Because the thing is with topic modeling, it's, it's a subjective approach, right? It's unsupervised. There's no ground truth. Uh, nobody's going to give you an exact label. It's still humans that are doing the labeling. And what I consider to be a topic, you might disagree with me. And as such, there should be some visualizations in there so that you can either understand the model or explain what is happening to your stakeholders, to your users, to your audience. Now, I'm, of course, not going to go through all of them because th that would wait, take way too much time. But let's see which words contribute most to our topics. And let's take the top eight most frequent topics. We do 10 words instead of, I think, I believe it was five. And what we get is something like this. We see our topic and we can see the top 10 words that contribute to this specific topic. And, and we already saw that this one was about reinforcement learning. It already made sense, right? But we can now also see that you know, words like reward, environment, control, policies, those are very specific to reinforcement learning. So it gives us a little bit more confidence about what's happening here. Because it could be that some of those words might give you, nudge you towards a little bit different description of what the topic is about. And we can do the same thing for each and every topic that you see here. And some might be more logical than others. That's also something that you will experience because it's subjective. If I think, okay, this, this subject, I don't understand it. It's horrible the way that it's being described here. You might disagree with me. And it can be for a number of reasons. It can be because we didn't do the clustering properly, but it can also be because your domain knowledge exceeds my domain knowledge. So it's much easier for, for you to interpret some of these domain specific words. And so we can continue on with uh, going through all of these topics, seeing what is happening here. Um, but we can also say, okay, which topics are related to one another? I've created 150 topics. That, that's way too much. I think there are only 100 in there, maybe even less. So what we can do is we can essentially say, okay, let's visualize a heat map. And what we get then is we can see different small clusters of topics together. And some are more logical than others, and we can go over them. Uh, but it already gives you an understanding of, again, what is happening here. So we can and hover can over. Stop yeah. you here. Um, so what indicates a cluster to you in a visual like this? Is it a square of multiple um, blue? Uh, yeah, regions? yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it's these squares. If you do, this would have been a little bit more intuitive. If we would have done this, 
you get a mess, right? These are just zero until 147, I believe. But if I define the number of clusters, we're basically doing clustering on top of our topic representations to see which ones belong together. And, and then we get more, a little bit more structure with respect to you know, which topics belongs to, to which ones or which ones are similar to one another. Because it doesn't necessarily always have to be the case that we want to merge them. Maybe we're looking for subtopics. And that's also the thing, right? You have some granularity with respect to topic modeling. You can be very specific or you can, can be very vague and everything in between. Uh, and that also makes topic modeling difficult. Uh, and for that you need, I think you need visualizations, experimentations, things like that. And we can co continue on with those visualizations. Uh, let's see, we can visualize the documents. So we can put those documents into two-dimensional space like this and see if we can find relationship between documents, uh, between topics, of course. So we have here a cluster of reinforcement learning. And if we hover over them, we can see part of the abstract of an article. Uh, we can go over them to see if some of them make sense or not, because in all honesty, clustering won't work perfectly. You, you know, some documents might be in there that you don't think should be in there or vice versa. And this way we can have a little bit more intuition about where clusters are, where they appear, how they're related to one another. If the documents that we feel like are in one cluster or in one topic are actually in another. And we can go through and through with all these types of visualizations, um, experimentations, there is, a, <laughs> I'm asking quite a lot of the user in topic modeling, but the truth is I cannot give you one exact metric for when a topic model is perfect or is good or is great. And um, so you as the user will need to do human evaluation to make sure that something like this is accurate because it's very easy, very easy for me to create an exceedingly coherent topic representation that doesn't actually represent the topic well. Um, and as such, you have some, a little bit of responsibility when it comes to exploring these types of models. Now we have soon seen two pillars thus far, right? We have seen the, uh, the modularity. We have seen a bunch of visualizations. What's the third one that might be interesting to you? And that has to do in a way with modularity, but mostly with the back of words representation. Because we have a linear pipeline, a sequential pipeline, what's stopping us from putting something additional at the end? We can change and adapt the model however we want, so why not add stuff to it? And we have done just that with a bunch of variations in per topic. So you can do hierarchical topic modeling after you have trained your per topic model, because we're you now we have a, a nice representation of our topics. We have our bag of words. And let's see if there's some hierarchy on top of that. We can do some simple link, linkage on top of that, some hierarchical linkage, and extract the hierarchy from the topics that we've created before. We can do the same thing with dynamic topic modeling, so topics over time. If you talk about cars today, Tesla most likely will be named somewhere. If you talk about cars 20 years ago, that might not be the case. So a topic that has a representation might be dynamic in a way between certain instances. And that can be time, but it can also be classes. Because if we're talking about, let's say, certain policies, political policies, then Obama might talk different from uh, Trump about certain things. And one leader might say something entirely different. They're talking about the same thing, but the way they're talking about that, uh, the representation is different. And because we have all these variations, we don't need five, 10 packages to do both hierarchical topic modeling and dynamic topic modeling. And then we also have to make sure those packages are linked to one another. And then we also have to make sure that uh, they all have the same features or the same sort of representations. 
The idea here is that with these three pillars, it gives you a lot of freedom, a lot of control to do whatever you want. Um, and that brings me to the, to the most, most important thing that's happening here is that it's all about you, the developer. You know, you, the people who are watching, you are, who are using this package, know what's best for their specific use case. Because who am I to say that you should be using HDBScan or that you should be using K-Means? I don't know. You know, there, there, there might be cases where one is better than the other, even though that a, a model mount outperformed the other, there are much more things to consider than just, you know, accuracy. If you're using it in production, you know, mini batch K means it's just a little bit faster and can be used in the incremental approach. If you want to be using a fully CPU based per topic instance, you can, instead of sentence transformers, just use TFIDF. If you want to be using a, GP, a full, fully GPU powered uh, per topic model, then swap out UMAP and HDB scan with their QML. Uh, uh, components and, and the entire thing is almost entire thing is, is, is GPU accelerated. So by, by having these three pillars, that, that modularity, those variations and those visualizations, I'm hoping it gives a lot of control back to the developer because I'm not the developer. I, I'm not doing your use cases. I, I'm not running the model for you. You are doing that. And, and you are the ones who have very specific use cases. <laughs> I've found that over the last few years, I get so many different types of use cases uh, for which the default per topic instance doesn't work. I think most topic modeling techniques don't work uh, that easily across all use cases. I mean, we, we always have and always will have the no free lunch theorem where one model uh, isn't the best across all use cases. So instead of giving you one perfect model, I'm, I'm hoping by giving you, you know, the full potential to do whatever you want, um, it works for your specific use case, uh, for your audience, for your paper, for your research, for whatever it is um, that you're working on. And that's, I think, um, the design choice that's most important about not only Bird Topic, but if you have seen it, Keybird and Polyphos also, modularity, 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 giving you variations, giving you control, giving you options. Uh, because how annoying is it to be restrictive in the things that you're doing? I mean, I'm stubborn enough to go into packages and change all things, but uh, that's just annoying to be doing. Um, that's what I have to say about Bird Topic so far. Uh, to those still here, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions regarding per topic specifically, uh, please go to the issues page uh, or the discussions. Uh, there are no, never any stupid questions. So ask away if you run into any problems. Uh, I'm here. Uh, hopefully I respond soon enough. If I don't, ping me, that's okay. Uh, if you're interested in some of the things that I write about, feel free to go onto Medium or uh, my own website. There are either tutorials regarding mostly transformer-based models, sentence transformers, these kind of things, and some of the things about transitioning into data science. Uh, because for me as a psychologist who had never programmed before, uh, that can be a challenge, right? And if there's something that's not answered in any of those things, we still have Twitter and LinkedIn, of course. And, uh, and I'll do my best to answer uh, whatever I can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. That was a, an incredible rundown of, of, of the package. We have a lot of questions. I have uh, a few of them. And thank you for addressing um, uh, all of these points. One quick question is, will the notebook be shared or public at, at some point? Sure. I have to think about where. <laughs> uh, so maybe we can discuss whether uh, something at Cohere or outside of that is possible. But yeah, of course. Yeah, the visuals here are incredible. Like the, 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 the Lego blocks, I think all of that sort of explains the philosophy really well. Um, right. Thanks. You touched a little bit on, on evaluation and how that is sort of up to the person doing the exploration. Um, what are 
you know, a couple of tips. So if you were in, in your own, let's say, examinations, when you were doing your own topic modeling, exploring, uh, what do you look for? Is there one of the visualizations that you look for at first, for example? Are there two that, you, that are your go-to visualizations? Um, and what kind of questions do you find uh, yourself doing that is not sort of right now encoded in the, in the package? Um, so the difficult thing with topic modeling, right? I mean, as I mentioned before, there, there isn't a ground truth. Nobody tells me uh, what should be exactly in those documents. If they did, it wouldn't be topic modeling, it would be a classification task, right? Um, so I try to go through the topics as much as possible um, together with domain experts to see if they make sense and to see whether it actually follows their way of thinking. Uh, there are a bunch of visualization, of course, to, that you can use for that. Oftentimes, I like to use this one. Because when you show those words, like uh, you know, um, object detection here, for example, they might still have the question, OK, it's about object detection, sure. But what specifically? And then you can OK say, OK, I have these and these topics. And I see YOLO here, for example. And uh, you know, uh, other types of, of, of things that you that you see in there. And it helps that you can give stakeholders or users something to, to play around with, to also give them some control over the topic model, whether they are um, technical or not. Clear. Um, one property of using embedding models for uh, topic modeling is that each document belongs to one topic. Um, is that is that a challenge? Is it uh, or is it good enough and it can solve the vast majority of topic modeling uh, use cases? What's your sense? Uh, <laughs> annoying answer, but it is both actually. Mm. So uh, it is of course a challenge, but in most use cases out of the box, it works well enough. Um, that can be a problem, of course, because some people don't want well enough, uh, rightfully so, of course, uh, especially you have long documents that contain multiple topics. Uh, then it's a matter of splitting them, synthesizing them, making sure that you have either paragraphs or sentences and just throw those in. And then you get the exact same thing. So it, it should be a simple step to go from, you know, uh, pages of documents to sentences and then throw it in per topic. Um, but it doesn't have the same property out of the box that, for example, LDA has, where it immediately considers multiple, multiple topics within a single document. You do have to do some uh, pre-processing for that. And that's with I'm highly uh, all clustering task. So what we do have with HDB scan is we have a probability that a certain document is in a certain topic. And as such, we can see, okay, if there's also a high probability that this document also belongs to something else, uh, that way we can say, okay, there might be multiple topics in that document. So that's a way that we can circumvent it. But that's the key word here, circumventing it. Um, it's not something that you have out of the box and that's something to take into account, yeah. And do you think that the default flow of just fit transform bird topic is it does it favor short text or long texts if somebody was doing either you know titles of or abstracts or very long documents uh, what would you be your sense of what what would you switch in the pipeline to support either long text or short text or is it just uh, a good default for both kinds of uh, text archives um it depends mostly on the content of those documents and um you know, short texts typically contain one topic, each document. It's, it's a strong assumption, but it generally works. If you have long documents, there tend to be multiple topics in there. So we want to split them. But even in long, long documents, it, it can still talk about a single topic. So why would you then split it and multiply the same topic by a thousand times because you, from a long document, create a thousand sentences? What you do have to do in those cases is take into account the model that you're using. Transformer-based models, although working exceedingly well, have token limits, which 
has been a big problem with long documents. You have long former and you have these kind of models, um, but there still aren't that many out there. So then instead you can consider back of words approaches because those can take long documents a little bit better into account. So, so don't be afraid to resort to models that have been here 20 years. They still work exceedingly well in a lot of use cases. And I'm curious to also pick your brain on your API design philosophy. Um, you identified some of the main, the three pillars uh, that you think of in, in BERT topic, but I'm sure while you're also doing other, other libraries, there are a few things that um, you've, you've picked up or lessons learned uh, of what makes a good um, API. Um, and I think, for example, I mean, there's a very clear scikit-learn sense to, to some of that. Um, curious to pick your, your mind on just API design philosophy. What makes for uh, a good API design for, for tasks like this? I think if I go back to something I've shown previously is this and this. So we have modularity. You can, you can change whatever you want, but out of the box, it works well enough for a lot of use cases. So what most people want when they're trying new technologies, they just want it to work. You have three lines of code, it works, it runs, and then you can look at it and say, okay, this is a horrible package. <laughs> I go with something else, that's fine. Um, but you can also say, okay, it's almost there and I want to change these, these and these things. And that has been the focus mostly on uh, of the coding of the, of the design uh, that I had in mind, making sure that for most users it works out of the box because topic modeling is also used by a lot of people who don't code 24 seven. Um, so for those people, it needs to work. And for, for the ones that want to dive into it a little bit deeper, uh, they can expand upon it. Um, similarly with designing all of this, uh, it has been a struggle at times to find that balance between out of the box, you know, it works well enough and uh, you can do everything you want with it. Uh, and you can see that back in some of the things that I've, um, uh, I've designed uh, a few years ago. So at some point I opened up the possibility to use your own UMAP model. And the, the parameter is still UMAP underscore model, but you can throw in k-means or anything else in there. So technically, we should change that to cluster underscore uh, or, or reduction underscore model or something like that. Um, so, <laughs> so with a few years uh, of developing this, you see some of these things being snuck in um, into the package. And uh, some of things are, are better than, than others and some things still work and, and you know, should be improved. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we have a lot of questions. We're going to get um, to them. I don't think we're going to be able to answer all of them. I would uh, suggest to people to uh, visit the Cohere Discord. There's a talking language AI forum there, um, and there's a specific thread for BERT topic and this discussion. Um, and so, and this goes for both people seeing it live, but also people seeing it on, on YouTube later. Uh, we'll keep it alive. You can keep answering your question. We'll have the community answer. We'll, we'll do our best to uh, get the, the, the questions answered there. Um, before we take a couple more questions, I'm curious to hear your very high level sort of overview of, let's do maybe polyfuzz first, or let's do, let's do Kiebert first and then uh, uh, polyfuzz. Ah, Kiebert, Kiebert is a fun one. Um, let me just quickly go to this one. It's easier for those who want to visit the, uh, uh, the package. Uh, Keybird is, is super simple, really, really, really basic um, as a default. Essentially what we're doing is we want to extract keywords. And the way we're doing that is we create a document embedding from a document. And then from each word in that document, we use the same language model and create embeddings from those. We do cosine similarity and pick the ones that are most similar. That's it, that, that's all we're doing. Um, and the reason that, that works so well is for two reasons. Uh, language models tend to have um, the same dimensional space with respect to both words and documents. 
that works quite well, especially when you then do cosine similarity or, or another distance measure. The second thing is, is the same with, with per topic. It's so intuitive. There's not much going on there. And then on top of that, we can do some fine tuning. So there's an algorithm called maximal marginal relevance where we can say, okay, I'm going to throw out words that are very similar to each other. Uh, I'm going to introduce some diversity of the keywords that I have. Um, we can do things with the count vectorizer to only, again, use nouns or, or verbs or whatever is interesting to your specific use case. But the way it works, like per topics, really straightforward. Sometimes things don't have to be so complex. And what about Polyphos? Polyphos. Polyphos um, was developed as more as a focus on that modularity thing that I did with Inbird Topic and, and Keybird. I created all the different uh, backends like Spacey Jensen. You now I threw them in. There are a lot of different ways you can do fuzzy string matching. Um, and again, I had to install all of these packages and it all worked differently. And I wanted to do some evaluation and some clustering. And at some point, you know, it was easier just to create one single thing that can do a lot of different types of fuzzy string matching and I can easily compare them. And I think that's something that's happening in the industry right now quite, quite a lot is that there's an overload of models and packages and, and things you can do. And for me, that gets, gets tiresome really quickly uh, to constantly have to download new packages, try them out, that all do the, essentially the same thing, right? So, so why isn't there one package that can do all of that and, and that can give me that output? And if I want to dive deeper into one of those other packages, okay, that, that's the next step. But first, I want to explore what's possible um, and what you can do with it. And, and, and hence, Olifos was born. Uh, there's a couple of, we can tackle maybe quickly a couple of the, uh, some of the audience questions. So um, one is about multilingual uh, use cases. So should somebody who is dealing with a language other than English expect the default um, bird topic pipeline to work or what should they be switching in? Uh, so, Generally, a multilingual model that works quite well. You can even use a, a back of words approach because it doesn't consider language per se. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that uh, there are some Germanic languages that it still captures in an uh, in in the English uh, in the English model because the structure of the text is is really similar, um, and it still does the the clustering decently. But generally, just use a multilingual sentence transform model, you should be okay. Okay. And the question maybe you get quite often is uh, how to deal with that noise cluster? <laughs> uh, use case means or anything else, which can also do, of course, uh, there are a few parameters that you can tweak within HDB scan to reduce them. So you can, you can do that. Uh, you can also say, I'm going to uh, use a soft clustering to assign, hard assign the outliers to actual clusters. Um, you can even say, I'm going to do a cosine similarity of the um, local CTF IDF document representation with that of the clusters. Uh, and I think those are mostly it. I think there are a few more tricks that you can do, but this should cover most use cases. Okay. And there are questions about just comparisons with LDA and top to VEC. Um, what, what comes to your mind as people say, how, how different is the end result of these three topic models? Yeah, so there's, there's something tricky going on there because um, when we want to compare topic modeling uh, techniques, we again need to resort in a way to evaluation. And I can give you different use cases where per topic works exceedingly well over LDA, but there's bound to be cases where LDA works way much better than a per topic. And I think the most important thing with per topic is that you understand how it works. And if you understand how it works, 
and, and why it works, then you can use it easily for your own use cases, right? Uh, and you can go back to that human evaluation and just try both out. And if you think that LDA has nicer, nicer topic representations or more accurate ones to your use cases, definitely use that one. Um, but because it's so, so subjective, and I, I had a really hard time writing the bird topic paper, because when I came to evaluation, I, I was like stuck. Am I going to use coherence measure, diversity, accuracy of the clusters? I need, do I need to involve humans in this evaluation? At some point, it became too much. And I was like, OK, but that's why Bird Topics modular. To make it so it fits your use case. Um, and of course, there are evaluation measures. Doesn't mean we need to ignore them. But there's a package of this, uh, OCTIS, that has implemented a huge number of uh, evaluation metrics. That doesn't mean you need to run them all. But there might be some metrics that are better suited to your use case. So, so you might be looking at topic diversity for an evaluation metric, but you can also look for topic coherence as a metric or, or uh, you know, there's so many of them out there. Maybe F1 scores, if you want to make it in a classification task, that's also fine. Uh, but I don't know exactly how you want to compare them in which specific use case. So as much as I want to say, okay, use this metric, uh, unfortunately I can't. It's a quick question on how topic modeling user usually is like an exploratory process and like the end result of it would be a report or a dashboard of some sort. Um, what usually comes next? Or have you seen it, for example, be implemented in a pipeline or like in an online system? Um, have you, for example, came across any features in any apps or consumer apps that you, you looked at the feature and you were like, this is topic modeling in the back end? Yeah, so uh, what we mostly see in the, indeed with topic modeling is for detecting trends. And uh, you, you see that in, in research quite a lot. Uh, but is being more and more used in um, online settings, right? So uh, it was newly released a few months ago uh, where Bird Topic now supports online topic modeling, where you can cons continuously fine tune your topic model based on topics that come in today. So I I'm seeing more and more messages uh, of people wanting to use that specific feature because, you know, if they have tickets, for specific software, uh, there might be bugs coming up today that weren't relevant yesterday and that we want to quickly find and do something with. Uh, so for those use cases, it has become a little bit more interesting. Mm. But in all honesty, I, I've seen quite a lot of different use cases, but it's still mostly explorative. That, that's that, that you see most often, yeah. Very interesting. Have you come across any use cases? I'm really interested in this area of using GPT models in the flow. Uh, really excited about using them to name clusters, for example, but I don't know if you've, uh, if any of these areas interest you. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think there are a few models out there that have taken bird topic and did some zero shot learning on there and some GPT-3 uh, uh, generation. And that works sometimes. But the thing is, and, and that's what I, I need to consider most with such a pipeline is uh, the speed of the thing. It already can take quite a while to generate those embeddings. Uh, many people still want to do it on the CPU, which is fine, uh, but then we need to resort with TF-IDF or something like that. And then something like GPT-3, now it becomes quite large to be using. It's, it's not, a, not a fast model. Um, and that, also means another dependency. Um, you know, it complicates things. And that's, that's fine, that's perfect, but that's for the user to further fine tune. And the moment there comes a lightweight, uh, easy to use GPT-based type, type of approach, I'll be the first <laughs> to want to implement it in, uh, in Bird Topic. Uh, unfortunately, for now, uh, there isn't, but you know, that's the great thing about having modularity in mind, if, if it's released, then, then we just tack it on at the end. <laughs> and then we have better representations. It's, it's that easy, right? Yeah, 
Amazing. I'll, I'll keep you updated on that. Uh, Great. Thank you. Uh, my, my final question is, so you've created so much value for a lot of people, figuring out this process, building up all the, of this code, um, hosting it and sharing it as open source, dealing with issues and bugs and other people's use cases. How can the community be helpful to you? How can people or a data scientist or a software engineer who's benefited from Vertopic or, or any of the, of your other packages, how can they be helpful um, to you and to, to the project? Uh, there are two ways. Um, first, I think most important one, issues and bugs, definitely. You know, we're considering developers, so, so we still want to give new features and, and have interesting things, but it should work. And if it doesn't work, let me know if we can figure something out. Um, uh, the second thing really is discussions and, and feature requests. Um, the reason for that is if we're focusing here on making sure that you have a one-stop shop for topic modeling, keyword extraction, fuzzy string matching, these kind of things. Um, and if there are features missing that makes it more difficult for you to do your job or to do your work, let me know. And then we can look together to see whether you know, it's easily implemented if it works within a pipeline and we can discuss these things because online topic modeling was implemented because somebody asked for it. Uh, topics over time because something, somebody asked for it. Class-based topic modeling because somebody asked for it. Um, if you ask for it, uh, I cannot promise it will be implemented, of course. Uh, unfortunately, not everything is that, is that simple. Um, but that grows the package and that, that is what makes it to what it is right now and what it's, you know, potentially could be in the future. Uh, if not, that's also fine. If there's something better out there that's, that, 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 that makes you ignore per topic, go for it because we're doing this for the community. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me know, communicate. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. Amazing. And the... The center for the community is the discussions tab in the Bird Topic GitHub re repo. Is that is that correct? Is that where people can discuss and uh, uh, you can you can do it on the discussion. It's also fine if you do it on the issues page. Okay. Really, I'm just one person. <laughs> I'm not gonna make it super structured. There's no company behind this. I, I, I haven't made a penny out of all of this, so I'm lazy enough. Just do it on the issues page. I don't care. Amazing. I'm sure a lot of people appreciate it. We'll have links to all of these um, in, in the Discord, but also in the YouTube description. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for uh, coming on board. This was a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you for all your work and for your, your presentation today. Uh, really enjoyed uh, having you on the, the program. Yeah, really thank you for having me here on the very first talk of, uh, of the series. I'm really excited to see what comes next. So. Uh... Let me know. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, we have our second uh, guest booked up. So hopefully we'll do this uh, maybe once a month for, for the next couple of months. And ah, awesome. uh, you know, more after. Uh, thank you so much, Martin.